Decolonizing Wealth, Decolonizing Indigenous Issues. This week, I talked with Edgar Villanueva about being one of the very few indigenous people working in grant making and asked what he thinks Native American traditions have to teach philanthropy. Then we report from the United Nations, where indigenous women gathered from around the world this spring to flip the script on so-called indigenous issues. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Money. Today's guest says it is basically Kleenex adorned with dead presidents. But we can't deny it has power. So can we use money in ways that are healthier? Or is it inevitable that it uses us? My next guest says that turning to Native America may just hold the key to our modern ailments. Edgar Villanueva, a rare Native American voice in the world of philanthropy, has a book coming out, Decolonizing Wealth which delves into all this and more. What if money could be medicine instead of what divides us, he asks. Edgar, welcome to the show, glad to have you. Thank you very much, I'm happy to be here. So how the heck did you go from being on your way to being a minister to being (laughs) a program officer at a foundation? How did it happen? Well, you know, in, in many ways, it's not a stretch. I think I've always been inclined to service, um, wanting to help others. Ideally, um, or initially growing up, my my church was a major place of focus in my community and in my family. And it was the only vehicle that I knew of at that time to help people because it was a place where I had received help. Um, I later learned that there was the nonprofit sector and this, you know, many other avenues and ways to support folks. But I think the the essence of the church and the faith community is very connected to the mission of philanthropy in terms of loving others and helping others. So you go in loving others, helping others. You feel pretty good for a moment while you're in there. But this book is a devastating <laughs> takedown of philanthropy, which you call a, a, a living anachronism a contradiction in terms, just a place where white people give away stolen money and feel better about it afterwards. I mean, these turned out to be not just your own feelings about philanthropy, but a whole lot of people that you interview. Absolutely. Um, The point of the book is to be a bit provocative and to cause a conversation about how we can be better. Um, I have lived and worked within philanthropy for 14 years and have, you know, personally seen beyond some of the um, altruistic facade, so to speak, into the shadows. And so um, philanthropy has a culture where we often have an extreme politeness because we're good folks doing good work. And a lot of that work is is very good. And I should not, you know, I will not discredit that. Um, However, uh, there's a lot that could be changed. And I think of philanthropy as my family, but there's some dysfunction there that as uh, as I would with my own family, I want to call out that dysfunction and call us to a place of being better. Now, a, a core part of your story is about being Native American in philanthropy and being young when you entered the field. Talk a bit about what you learned about what was common in your experience being a one of a kind in an institution like that? Uh, what was common with other people who, had, who were brought in kind of as, I don't want to say tokens, but they were kind of alone in their field? Absolutely, and I, and I think tokens is an adequate description for many of us. The field often likes to hire people like me who come from the community with lived experience and uh, you know sometimes to check a box and there are a lot of uh, diversity initiatives and i think the intentions are well-meaning but often we don't have a culture within the field that supports um, our ability to be successful in the space and so after coming into philanthropy and working for a number of years i began to see that the way the culture was inside of the institution um, did not always mirror the state admission, right, of the organization. How so? Give us an example. So I think when you look at the values of 
stated values that a lot of foundations have around equity, justice, um, really, you know, moving the needle on certain social issues. But you look who are calling the shots and designing those initiatives and how um, exclusive that table is. And you also look at who is receiving those resources. You see a lot of um, inequality there. I mean, one of the shocking things that you say is that many of the members of the board have appeals, have requests pending at the institutions that they are the board of, and they're very rarely rejected. Absolutely. So, you know, there are, um, there are lots of, most people tend to like to fund people who look like them or people that they know, uh, people that they have relationships with and trust. And uh, if you don't have people who are not in your network who don't look like you or come from the same type of place, then uh, those folks are less likely to have the same type of access to funding. Okay, so people should read the book if they want to hear the chapter and verse of what went on there. It wasn't altogether pretty. But you do kind of dust yourself off, and the majority of the book is dedicated to what could be done differently. Absolutely. Um, give us some of the examples or some of the strategies. For one thing, you see there needs to be an apology. And you describe a scene with a lot of philanthropists in, I think it was North Carolina, where a young white guy gets up and does exactly that, kind of cops to his history. Can, can you describe that moment and what it meant to you? Sure, so uh, the particular moment you're describing, uh, a young man at a funders conference uh, got up to make a presentation and he began sharing uh, his presentation. His remarks included sharing that he had uh, been the descendant of a, a great grandfather who owned slaves. And he wanted to acknowledge that history and apologize for it. And so a simple apology, of course, cannot undo the years of traumatization that, that slavery, genocide, colonization has caused. But I think when we get to a place where we can apologize and acknowledge that, um, what role our families may have played in that process, it at least gets us to a place where we can begin to move on in some kind of way. And so I think for philanthropy, um, understanding that the resources that we have were often um, accumulated in ways that cause trauma, especially in communities of color. And so when we acknowledge that history, we learn about it, first of all, because so many don't know, uh, we learn about the history and we acknowledge that. Um, and then we begin to apply that lens to how we're distributing resources. It could really be transformational. Why not just give the money back? Why not just give the land back? That's often a, a point that is made. Just, just give it back. You know, I, I, I like that point, actually. Um, but I think when we think about decolonization as a political process, which literally means to give the land back, to reinstate rights, maybe some people leave, and you know, uh, settlers leave and go back to their countries of origin. Uh, it really gets stuck as a political process because in the 21st century America, there really is no uh, reality, uh, I believe, where we're, we're not gonna be together, right? Our businesses are intertwined, our families are intertwined at this point. And so I think the best path forward is for us to recognize the uh, shared trauma that colonization has caused, not only for people of color, but for white people. Um, and think about how we can come together in uh, a collective healing process. So how can we, can we? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I really believe that we can. Um, I'll be honest, my, the, 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 the book tells my personal story of sort of coming to terms with that reality, um, especially post-election. I was feeling a lot of hurt, um, devastated like many around the results of the election. And um, I did not think of people who voted for Trump, for example, as my relatives or my brothers and sisters, right? And I spent some time in, in a community talking to an elder who said to me, Edgar, those folks are your relatives. That's our value. You have to love them. You have to see them as your brothers and sisters, even though they're making choices that may harm you. Even though they're showing up in the streets with, you know, blood and soil signs? Absolutely. I think we have to be, we have to acknowledge that hurting people hurt others. And I'm not saying that we have to, um, of course, condone their behavior or um, it, it's, it's unjustified. But I think if we can see that all of us are suffering in, in su at some level and begin to create ways to be less polarized, to come together in some type of circle, 
um, we can begin to think of ways to move forward together. So does that look like foundations going through that process and funding coming together projects? I think so. There are some foundations who are, are doing, uh, you know, funding initiatives in, in that way, sort of radical solidarity um, or finding ways to support uh, coming together across the divides. But I also think foundations can um, fund sort of the healing or reversal of the traumatization that colonization has caused. And when I talk about colonization, we kind of think of like hundreds of years ago, right? Um, and I am referring to that type of colonization that has resulted in generations of trauma on communities. But I also mean, you know, history as early as yesterday, mm -hmm. because colonization ultimately is about dividing, controlling, exploiting, separating. And so when we look at what's happening right now in our country, we see that there's still a lot of th those tactics are in play to harm communities of color and um, those who are less resourced. And so I think philanthropy could be really intentional about moving its resources in ways that uh, facilitate coming together. So let's talk about that. I mean, it's not just what foundations fund, the good works that they go out there and fund. It's what they themselves do. You make the point that only a very small proportion of a foundation's endowment is ever given away. Absolutely. And there's sometimes a very big problem with where most of that money sits still. What needs to change at that level? I think there needs to be a lot more accountability. We are seeing now, I think, and hearing more conversations around what's happening with that 95%, right? So we know that, as you said, foundations are only required by Congress to pay out a minimum of 5% of their assets. That 95% um, is then invested in uh, mostly with the intention of earning more money. And so they are the majority of foundational resources, which is about $800 billion in this country, um, are invested in industries that harm and extract from communities. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the actual net value of philanthropy if we're investing crumbs sort of in progressive work and then with a 95% of our assets, um, we uh, there's no values around how that money is invested. I mean, it really goes to an idea about the system. Like we do actually believe in the system, says philanthropy, because that's how we're gonna make our money. And I'm gonna give you some crumbs along the way. Is there a way to flip that script while still, as it were, operating in the system? Absolutely. I, I think there is definitely an incremental approach to changing that and, and making the system as it is uh, work much better for us. We see foundations like the Heron Foundation, who was one of the first uh, to put 100% of its resources, assets into mission related um, um, investments that would reinforce the mission of the foundation. Um, the Ford Foundation has taken some steps in, in putting, um, committing $1 billion of its resources or assets into mission related, which is just a start considering the size of their, their endowment. Um, and then recently the Nathan Cummins Foundation um, has made a decision publicly and shared that publicly to put 100% of their resources into mission related. And so I think this, this type of maybe peer pressure effect hopefully will take hold um, but we also have seen that there is evidence that you can actually invest in good causes and have a return on that, which I think is important to foundations. Now, I should say here that until our wonderful viewers step up and take the place of philanthropy, uh, which we hope they will, um, philanthropy still props up this program. And philanthropy meaning foundations like the Novo Foundation. And I'm proud to say it in the sense that I really feel that foundation does operate differently and is in a way a kind of a model um, so that's my view on the matter. It seems like you agree. What other foundations do you lift up as doing things right or notably differently? There's a number of philanthropic models out there that I am very inspired by. Some are uh, really looking at how to democratize uh, decision making around who gets resources. Bringing folks who are from the front lines and most impacted by issues that foundations are trying to solve um, bringing those folks to the table to decide where that money should go, right? And so when you look at funds like the Groundswell Fund, which is this radical feminist fund, and how they engage you know, movement leaders actually around the table to raise that money, but also decide who should get that funding, um, I think is a beautiful example of philanthropy at its best. There are also indigenous models of philanthropy that exist that to support 
you know, a movement building in Native communities, but we've also indigenized the process of how we decide where that funding goes. Oh, so talk more about that. I mean, did Standing Rock, do you think, create a kind of um, shift in the appreciation that we as a society have of Native wisdom and strategy? Absolutely. Standing Rock really brought uh, Native leadership and Native worldview, worldview uh, to a global platform. It was a, a beautiful moment, even internal to our communities, for so many tribes to come together in solidarity. This was around um, the fights around the Dakota Access Pipeline. Absolutely. So that that moment where we had uh, all of our communities and so many folks who came in solidarity, influencers, um, to to really see um, firsthand, you know, was broadcast nationally, um, daily on the news, what was happening there. Um, until that moment, some folks didn't know that Native communities still existed yeah. in the U.S., right, which is really sad. Uh, but it also showed the power of resilience, um, coming together, spirituality, um, and um, has really created and opened the door for a lot of folks to ask, how can we help? And so uh, we've been really busy, those of us who work in this space, to be a, a broker or a bridge between philanthropy and resources and Native communities um, to really educate and to capitalize on this moment, so to speak, to uh, ed you know keep that awareness happening and get resources to our communities. Some big players, I think Wells Fargo among them, have said that they want to repair some of the damage. And um, what do you make of those sorts of com com you know commitments, promises? No, I, th I think that organization individuals or organizations when they get to a place of acknowledging harm that they've caused um i'm open to hearing i'm open to sitting down and having a conversation i think you know and talking with folks who work with offenders um and work to to repair and and rehabilitate offenders i've learned that it's not about at all um giving them a pass right for the harm they've caused but really understanding their intentions and hearing from them gives us more insight into the motivation behind that type of behavior. So I, I, I might be a little Pollyanna, but I do believe in the human spirit um, and our ability to change. I have to, I have to keep hope alive. And although it, we're, we're pushing back against a, a really ugly, ugly um, history of white supremacy and uh, domination and, and all of that, I think, you know, that there, there is a possibility that folks can change. Yeah. And so sitting down and having the conversation is just a start. Without romanticizing Native American culture and experience, you do make the point that the Cherokee Nation doesn't have a word for poverty. Is that right? And that your mother, you feel, was your first real philanthropist. Just end on that note. Like, sure. What's the alternative way in, in Native America to address matters of inequality? So when uh, I started writing this book, I talked to a lot of elders in, in my community, in my tribe, the Lumbee tribe, around the, the word philanthropy. No one knows what that word is. I think my mom, after 14 years, can probably say the word philanthropy, and that's the field that I work, right? Um, but the, the idea that we have around that, the concept of the love of mankind and helping and supporting, um, the value is really connected to the word reciprocity. Mm -hmm. It's a quick way to sum it up. And that, that word embodies relationship, mutual caring. I give to you because you're going to give to me. Um, and we just coexist in relationship with one another. And I think that simple worldview, um, if that could be applied to philanthropy, we could see transform transformative change. Uh, philanthropy is very much transactional, um, power dynamics from who has resources, who, don't, who doesn't have the resources, the culture of competition that we perpetuate among nonprofits. It's very counterculture to our way and Native communities of existing and being. So I think the field has a lot to learn from us, the resilient who are, are still here, um, are still thriving after hundreds of years of um, you know, struggle. And so um, I'm interested in continuing to learn more from my own culture so that I can be a better human being and a better philanthropist. Edgar Villanueva, his book, Decolonizing Wealth, comes out October 16th. It's available for pre-order now. Write to us. Tell us what you think about this conversation. Thanks.
being here at the United Nations in New York City and meeting with indigenous peoples from around the world, it's so, so powerful. They do it because they know that there is a line that we have to draw and say, this isn't just a game. This isn't just a meeting in a building. There's a reality to us wanting to protect our future. And so I think it's important to lift up the struggle of indigenous women, not wanting to just be in the household or cooking or seen with these traditional roles. If people here know the struggles that exist in other areas and territories, there could be that compassion to somehow help, especially with the women and children in their struggle for land right and land title. Uh, but I want to place these in, in quote, positive changes uh, in terms of how the bank has responded to ethnic um, and this emerging international law within a broader critique of, the, of what's known as the development apparatus. We are right now here at the a permanent forum on indigenous issues is the 17th session and is talking about lands and territories. Indigenous people are marginalized in almost all development. That's why we are effectively participating in the agendas 2030 and about the sustainable development goals. And we are really pushing that no one is left behind, no matter how remote you are. I'm so happy to be at this 17th session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. The theme of this year, which is Indigenous Collective Rights to Land, Territories and Resources, is a very important issue for us as Indigenous people and pastoralists as well. I will plead that women land rights and girls in particular and Indigenous human rights defenders regarding land issues should be also taken into consideration. Estoy participando en este foro de pueblos indígenas con el propósito de plantear la situación de las, de las mujeres, de los jóvenes y los pueblos indígenas. Pero fundamentalmente lo que venimos a demandar a los estados y a las Naciones Unidas y a las instituciones financieras es el máximo respeto a los derechos humanos de los pueblos indígenas porque somos sujetos de derecho individual y colectivo. Venimos a demandar de que se nos respete el consentimiento libre, previo e informado antes de echar cualquier proyecto en nuestros territorios. We are here to recommend the UN to have a special uh, mechanism for free, prior, in, informed consent, which is enshrined in United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. A uh, lot of land grabbing and uh, militarization and violence against women is happening in my country. So these are some of the challenges that people face. Yo vengo hablando sobre eh, este derecho de los pueblos indígenas, también contaminación del agua, que es este están lavando oro, entonces contaminan el agua. Entonces ahí las mujeres necesitamos el agua, jalamos muy largo, don, a veces dos horas. Tres horas van a traer agua, entonces hablamos derecho de las mujeres también. We are asking to UN agencies that please let us live in our own land. In the hilly side, there are lots of hydropower projects which, which where uh, indigenous people living in the hillsides are displacing by the hydropower projects, which, which is unfair. We want to ask the uh, UN agency to support us to pressurize our government to stop this kind of violence, which is we are facing nowadays. So thank you. Our time is up, and we have to move on to the next side event. Thank you, everybody. Want to get us? Indigenous women from these poor countries, as we call ourselves, they are always resilient. No matter what burden it is, we carry with a positive uh, thinking that something will be okay. And the little things that we do really matter because those are the things that we do and we build up and make a difference for our community. If you enjoyed all this, head over to our website, that's lauraflanders.org, and sign up for our newsletter or check out our web exclusive content, or better yet, subscribe to our podcast and you'll get my weekly commentary too. You can write to me, laura at lauraflanders.org. Tune in next time. For now, stay kind, stay curious. Thanks for watching.